Why are some mountain tops covered with snow even throughout summer? The higher you travel up a mountain, the colder the temperature becomes and the thinner the air becomes as well. Which means there are smaller quantities of the gases, like oxygen, that make up air. Some mountains are so high that the air at the top is always cold. Never warming enough for snow to melt not even in the summertime. No creatures can live in the highest regions of tall mountains, withstanding the cold. Wind, and thin air, beyond a certain height, 13,000 feet. Or 3,965 meters, in warm regions, even trees cannot grow on mountainsides. To stay alive when climbing the highest peaks. Mountain climbers must take a long tanks of oxygen to breathe. Why are some mountain tops covered with snow even throughout summer? The higher you travel up a mountain, the colder the temperature becomes and the thinner the air becomes as well. Which means there are smaller quantities of the gases, like oxygen, that make up air. Some mountains are so high that the air at the top is always cold. Never warming enough for snow to melt not even in the summertime. No creatures can live in the highest regions of tall mountains, withstanding the cold. Wind, and thin air, beyond a certain height, 13,000 feet. Or 3,965 meters, in warm regions, even trees cannot grow on mountainsides. To stay alive when climbing the highest peaks. Mountain climbers must take a long tanks of oxygen to breathe. What can we do to protect ourselves if a tornado comes? Only between 700 and 800 tornadoes occur in the United States each year. And of those, only between 1 and 2 percent cause deaths. Communities watch for tornadoes when weather conditions are right and issue warnings to alert people if a tornado has been spotted in the area. In addition to warnings being broadcast on the radio and television, many communities have tornado sirens that can be heard for many miles. Signaling that a tornado has been spotted and people should take cover. The best place to be during a tornado is under the ground, in a storm cellar or basement of a building. Take a radio with you, so that you can keep track of the storm. A flashlight will help you to see if the electricity goes out. And a first aid kit can help treat any minor injuries that might occur. If you can't go underground, go to an inside room on the lowest floor of a building. Hallways are good places to go. As are bathrooms the plumbing and pipes in them are strong and could resist violent winds. Get under a stairwell or sturdy piece of furniture. If you can, which will protect you from falling objects. Avoid being near windows, many tornado injuries are caused by flying debris. And sharp objects, 
like pieces of broken glass, are very dangerous. If you are outside, try to lay as low as possible on the ground in a ditch, valley, or under a strong bridge. Protect your head with your hands. Don't seek shelter in something that can be lifted into the air by a tornado, like a car or mobile home. How much snow makes an inch of rain? Ordinarily, 10 inches of snow has about the same amount of water as 1 inch of rain. But temperature affects this general rule. The dry, fluffy snow we see during very cold weather holds less. Water it could take 30 inches of that snow to equal 1 inch of water. The heavy, wet snow that falls when temperatures are just around freezing contains more. Moisture as few as 3 inches of that kind of snow could melt into 1 inch of water. Why are some mountain tops covered with snow even throughout summer? The higher you travel up a mountain, the colder the temperature becomes and the thinner the air becomes as well. Which means there are smaller quantities of the gases, like oxygen, that make up air. Some mountains are so high that the air at the top is always cold. Never warming enough for snow to melt not even in the summertime. No creatures can live in the highest regions of tall mountains, withstanding the cold. Wind, and thin air, beyond a certain height, 13,000 feet. Or 3,965 meters, in warm regions, even trees cannot grow on mountainsides. To stay alive when climbing the highest peaks. Mountain climbers must take a long tanks of oxygen to breathe. What causes earthquakes? An earthquake is a great shaking of Earth's surface. It is caused by the cracking and shifting of the plates of rock that make up the planet's layered crust. As shifting plates suddenly slide past one another, vibrations in the form of waves are released. These shock waves travel through Earth, gradually weakening as they move farther from the spot or spots where the quake began, which is called the epicenter. Regions located near faults, places where cracks in Earth's crust are known to exist, are particularly vulnerable to earthquakes. Earthquakes vary in size and intensity. They may last a few seconds or continue for a few minutes. They may cause no damage or they could result in widespread destruction and the deaths of thousands of people. Earthquake vibrations can be so violent that they collapse bridges and buildings, destroy highways, cause landslides, and lead to flooding if they occur in shallow water near a coast. When they occur under the ocean, earthquakes can cause a giant wave called a tsunami, which can reach heights of more than 100 feet.
What is a hurricane? A large and fierce storm, a hurricane starts in the tropical areas of the Pacific, North Atlantic, or Indian Oceans, where it gathers great quantities of moisture and thermal energy, or heat. It is circular in shape. Spiraling inward toward a nearly calm center that is called the eye of the hurricane. A hurricane may blow inland, where its high winds, ranging from 75 to 200 miles 121 to 322 kilometers per hour. And hard rain can cause terrible damage and coastal flooding. A hurricane might spread over an area up to 600 miles, 966 kilometers, wide and last for well over a week. Once a hurricane moves over cooler ocean waters or land, though, it begins to lose its strength. In some parts of the world hurricanes are called typhoons. How big is Earth? Earth, which is almost round in shape, measures 24,901 miles. 39,842 kilometers, around at its widest part, the equator. The equator is the imaginary line that crosses outer space begins about 600 miles. 960 kilometers, above Earth. The planet midway between the North and South Poles. A measurement through Earth at the equator in other words. The planet's diameter reveals that it is 7,926 miles, about 12,700 kilometers, across. Earth's weight, or mass, the amount of matter that makes it, is around 6 sextillion tons. That is 6 with 21 zeros after it. Because Earth cannot be put on an enormous scale to find its weight. Scientists use the laws of gravity and mathematical equations to figure this out. What is the order of the planets in our solar system? Starting with that closest to the Sun, the order of the planets is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. If you have trouble keeping track of this order, remember this sentence. In which the first letter of each word is also the first letter of a planet my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. How old is Earth? Scientists estimate that Earth is between 4.5 and 5 billion years old. They have reached this conclusion by studying moon rocks and meteorites. Rocks that have fallen from space to Earth that they believe were formed at the same time as our planet. Could a balloon float into outer space?
the air that makes up Earth's atmosphere becomes thinner and lighter the higher up you go. So a helium-filled balloon would stop rising once the air surrounding it weighed the same as the helium gas inside it. Scientists think that 20 miles, 32 kilometers, above Earth is about as far as any balloon could travel. Why are hurricanes given names? Tropical storms, including hurricanes, that have wind speeds of at least 39 miles. 63 kilometers per hour are given human names to identify them. This way, meteorologists or weather scientists can keep track of several tropical storms at once without confusion. Monitoring tropical storms is important for the safety of ships that sail in tropical waters and for people who live along tropical ocean coasts who need to be warned of approaching danger. The practice of naming hurricanes and tropical storms began in the 1950s. For a long time until 1979 only women's names were used. The World Meteorological Organization decides which names will be on the list. Creating lists for six years at a time. The names begin with all the letters of the alphabet, with the exception of Q. U, X, Y, and Z, because few names begin with these letters. Hurricanes and tropical storms are given names from the list in alphabetical order as they appear. And a name may be reused once six years have passed. But if a storm has caused very great damage, its name will be retired. Which means it cannot be reused for at least ten years. What is hail? A hailstone is a ball made of layers of ice. It starts out as an ice crystal in a cloud, just as a snowflake does. But a hailstone is moved about by drafts or winds in the cloud. Rising into cold air and drifting down where the air is warmer, again and again. The process builds up layers of ice and melting snow on the hailstone. While the average size of a hailstone when it finally makes its way to earth is one quarter of an inch across. Hailstones can become large enough to cause real damage, denting cars, and damaging crops. The biggest recorded hailstones weighed well over two pounds. Fortunately, hailstones don't fall too often and usually only during spring and summer thunderstorms. What is a tornado? A tornado is a dark, funnel-shaped column of violently twisting air that extends down from a cumulonimbus, or thunderstorm, cloud. It is usually accompanied by thunder, lightning, and heavy rain. Unlike ocean-generated tropical storms and hurricanes, tornadoes begin over land and occur when low, moist. Warm winds blowing in one direction meet cooler, higher, drier winds blowing in a different direction. 
the rotating winds of a tornado can reach up to 300 miles, 483 kilometers per hour, and if it extends close enough to Earth it can destroy anything in its path. While most tornadoes only travel along the ground for a few minutes and a few miles. Leaving narrow paths of destruction, others have been known to last for hours. Touching down many times and leaving behind hundreds of miles of damage. Despite their small size and short duration. Tornadoes do more complete damage than any other kind of weather disaster. What is a volcano? A volcano is a natural opening in Earth's crust through which hot molten, or melted, rock, known as lava as well as gases, steam, and ash. What remains after solid material is completely burned, escapes, often in a big, noisy eruption or explosion. These eruptions are thought to act like safety valves. Relieving the enormous heat and pressure that exist deep in Earth's interior. A volcano is usually a cone shaped mountain, its sides built up from solidified lava and ash. That has a hole or crater in its center through which it vents. There are several different kinds or stages of eruptions, many causing no damage to the places or people located near the volcano. But a few eruptions are huge and destructive, during these. Lava can pour out and run down the volcano into surrounding areas, and enormous suffocating clouds of steam, ash, hot gases, and shooting rock can travel downhill at great speeds, covering many miles. When Washington's Mount St. Helens exploded in 1980, for instance, such volcanic clouds killed millions of trees. One of the most famous and destructive volcanic eruptions occurred in AD 79 when Mount Vesuvius in what is now Italy erupted. Destroying the important Roman city of Pompeii. The Great Cloud of cinder and ash that covered the city preserved it remarkably. And much has been learned about ancient Roman times by studying these amazing ruins. M.T. Vesuvius is still an active volcano. Which means that volcanic activity still occurs there and eruptions happen from time to time. A volcano may also be described as dormant, which means that no activity has occurred for a long while but conditions still exist for an eruption to take place in the future. An extinct volcano is one that will never erupt again. Many volcanoes occur near the area where two ridges or plates of Earth's crust meet. Circling the Pacific Ocean where crust plates meet is a group of volcanoes known as the Ring of Fire. Plate movement in such regions may allow liquid rock, called magma. That is located in chambers in Earth's interior to rise, resulting in volcanic activity. Such conditions often result in earthquakes as well. Volcanic activity can take place under the ocean as well as on land. And when this happens the formation of islands sometimes results. The Hawaiian Islands were created by just such volcanic activity some 40 million years ago. Even today, two of the world's most active volcanoes Mauna Loa and Kilauea are located on the island of Hawaii. 
Visitors to Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park can travel to the slopes that surround the Great Volcanoes. What is outer space? Outer space refers to the area that exists beyond Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere is divided into several layers based on the temperatures found in each of those layers. The troposphere is the layer closest to Earth, it extends about 5 to 10 miles. 8 to 16 kilometers, above the planet's surface. Most of our weather rain, snow, sleet comes from the troposphere. Temperatures in the troposphere can fall as low as minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 80 degrees Celsius. The next layer, called the stratosphere, stretches from 11 to 30 miles. 17 to 48 kilometers, above Earth's surface. The stratosphere contains the ozone layer, which protects all life on Earth from the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. Temperatures gradually rise in the stratosphere, reaching a high of around 28 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 2 degrees Celsius. The stratosphere is followed by the mesosphere, which goes to about 50 miles, 80 kilometers, above Earth. Temperatures drop well down into the negatives in the mesosphere, but in the next layer. The thermosphere, the sun's radiation heats the air to around 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, 600 degrees Celsius. The thermosphere ends at about 250 to 300 miles, 400 to 480 kilometers, above Earth. The final layer is called the exosphere, and at that level, the atmosphere is so thin as to be virtually non-existent. There is no line drawn in space marking the end of Earth's atmosphere and the beginning of outer space. But many scientists agree that outer space begins somewhere around 600 miles, 960 kilometers, above Earth. Can anything live in a desert? Plants have developed surprising adaptations to allow them to live in the harsh, dry desert. Many, like cacti, store water in their fleshy stems and have small or no leaves through which water can escape. They have deep, spreading root systems that take advantage of every bit of water. Either above or below the ground, some extending down 50 feet. Other desert plants produce seeds that can lie dormant or inactive for years. Springing to life when the rare rainstorm comes. Animals, too, have developed habits allowing them to survive in the desert. Many, for example, rest during the hottest part of the day in burrows dug in rocks or sand. Becoming active in the early morning and at night when temperatures cool. And people have had a long history of successfully living in the desert, the ancient Egyptians. Who lived in the Sahara Desert along the Nile River, created one of Earth's great civilizations. A source of water in a desert, like a river or an oasis where underground water reaches. 
the surface can be used to water crops and feed livestock, and life can flourish around it. What is fog? Like clouds, fog forms from tiny droplets of water that have evaporated from moist soil or from bodies of water. Fog is basically a low-lying cloud that touches Earth's surface. Water vapor in the air condenses to form fog under many circumstances. On cool mornings, the warm water vapor coming off lakes or ponds meets cold air and forms steam fog. Fog can also appear when a cool front of air meets a warm front. Technically, fog is not fog unless visibility the distance you can see in. Front or behind you is reduced to about one half mile, or about one kilometer. Why are rainforests so important to the health of our planet? In 1800 there were 7.1 billion acres of rainforest in the world. Now, just 200 years later, less than half 3.5 billion acres remain. Over 100,000 acres of the world's rainforests are destroyed each day. With trees cut down for their valuable wood and land cleared for farming. While covering just 2% of Earth's surface. The dense vegetation of these forests plays an important role in the health of our planet. The destruction of rainforests threatens the health of our planet by Reducing the amount of oxygen in our air and increasing carbon dioxide. Too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere keeps the sun's heat from radiating back into space. Increasing global temperatures, called the greenhouse effect. Global warming, in turn, could bring about major climate changes. Melting glaciers and rising sea levels, for example, could cause flooding of coastal regions. The plants in rainforests produce natural chemicals that fight off destruction by insects. And scientists have learned how to make plant-based insecticides from rainforest plants. Without destroying the rainforests, to spray on crops. These natural insecticides are far less toxic than synthetic, or human-made, chemicals. Numerous medicines as much as one quarter of all prescription drugs have been made from materials gathered in rainforests. And many more life-saving medicines may await discovery there. Many products like natural rubber, essential oils used in cosmetics and perfumes, and rattan. A material weave together to make furniture can be taken from rainforests without causing widespread destruction. In addition, rainforests can absorb huge amounts of water. When rainforests are destroyed, the vast amounts of rainfall in those regions cannot be absorbed, resulting in widespread flooding. Fortunately, international efforts have begun trying to save what remains of the rainforests by helping the people who destroy them find other ways to earn a living. Still, the destruction of these important forests continues at a rapid pace.
How large was the biggest earthquake ever recorded? Throughout recorded history, numerous giant earthquakes have occurred. Each resulting in human losses numbering in the thousands, sometimes several hundred thousand. The most deadly earthquake may have occurred in the summer. Of 1,201 in a region covering part of Egypt and Syria. Historical records show that this quake killed more than 1 million people there. An earthquake in China on July 27, 1976, is estimated to have killed more than 600,000 people. A giant earthquake occurred in Chile on May 22, 1960. Its shock waves measured 9.6 on the Richter scale. Thousands of people were killed in Chile, and the tsunami, or giant ocean wave, that it produced killed many more people on the islands of Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. It is not always the earthquakes with the biggest shock waves that cause the greatest damage. A large quake that occurs far out in the open ocean, for instance, may cause few problems. Earthquakes that hit cities where a lot of people live, on the other hand, cause the most harm to property and humans. What is a snowflake? When droplets of water in a cloud come into contact with tiny particles specks of dust. Tiny pollutants, minuscule pieces of vegetation that have been carried up by wind they freeze into ice crystals and begin to fall. Traveling through a cloud, these ice crystals may pass by air containing supercooled droplets. Which is water that is below the freezing point but remains a liquid. These droplets attach themselves to the sides of the ice crystals, where they freeze, forming snowflakes. When water freezes it forms flat, six-sided ice crystals. Though the way the crystals clump together accounts for a number of different snowflake shapes. As these crystals increase in size, they fall to earth. If the cloud from which they fall is low in the sky. The snowflakes are likely to stay frozen and will fall to the ground as snow. Although it's hard to imagine, each snowflake does seem to be unique. With a shape or size unlike any other. One American who enjoyed studying the weather, W.A. Bentley, spent nearly 50 years of his life making micro photographs of snowflakes to see if this was true. He never found two snowflakes that were alike. How do mountains and valleys form? A mountain is an area of high ground that rises 1,000 feet, 305 meters, or more above its surroundings. A group of mountains is called a mountain range. Almost all mountains and valleys the depressions between separate mountains or mountain peaks are formed when the huge moving plates of rock that make up Earth's crust collide with one another, which forces their edges to break and rise and fold, eventually creating a rising land mass. The process is a slow one, 
though, taking place over millions of years. It is also continuous, with new mountains being formed all the time. The age of a mountain can often be determined by its size and shape. Newer mountains are high and jagged, while older ones which have been eroded or worn down by wind and weather over millions of years are smoother and lower. The movement of rivers or glaciers, large masses of ice on land through mountains can also create valleys by slowly wearing rock away. Could a person be moved safely from one place to another by a tornado? Like Dorothy in the movie The Wizard of Ounce? No records show the survival of a person who has traveled long distances in a tornado. It is unlikely that any individual, or the structure in which he or she took shelter, could withstand the fierce sucking winds inside a tornado, which sometimes take objects from the ground and carry them high into the atmosphere for many miles. And remember, such a ride would eventually include a treacherous fall to the ground. Still, some records exist of non-living things that have survived wild tornado rides. In the summer of 1953, for instance, a woman in Massachusetts found a wedding gown in her backyard, dirty but in good condition. It had been carried some 50 miles, 80 kilometers, by a tornado. In the spring of 1979 people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, saw small slips of paper falling from the sky. These papers were canceled checks coming from a bank struck by a tornado earlier that day. The bank was located in a city in Texas, more than 200 miles, 322 kilometers away. What makes the wind blow? Wind is simply air that moves along Earth's surface. Its speed, or velocity, is measured in miles per hour, mph, or kilometers per hour, kilometers per hour. The sun is largely responsible for wind patterns around the world. The pattern begins in the tropics around the equator where the sun heats the air, which becomes lighter and then rises. Cooler air rushes into the area where the warmed air was, and the process is repeated again and again. The heat of the sun along with the eastern movement, or rotation, of Earth on its axis causes this pattern of air movement around the equator. And this pattern, in turn, affects wind patterns all over the world. Why are there deserts? A desert is a land area that receives less than 10 inches of precipitation, rain or snow, a year. As strange as it seems, that definition makes parts of Earth's. Polar regions the Arctic and Antarctica desert-like in their climates. The fierce cold there causes dry air, which allows for little precipitation. Most of Earth's deserts, however, are dry, 
rocky, and sandy. And because the greatest of them border the tropics. North Africa Sahara is the biggest, many of them are hot. Wind patterns are most responsible for the creation of deserts. Most of the world's deserts are located in areas that get a lot of warm, dry wind. That dry air blows through desert regions. Robbing them of moisture and reducing the likelihood of cloud formation and rainfall. High temperatures, which cause evaporation. And surrounding mountains which can stop moist air from approaching can also help CRE aid a desert climate. What is the equator? The equator is the imaginary line that circles Earth at its widest part around. It's middle at an equal distance from both the North and South Poles. It is 24,830 miles, 39,952 kilometers, long and runs east and west. Separating the northern and southern hemispheres of Earth. On maps the equator is given the coordinate 0 degrees latitude, the starting point from which all other latitudes are figured. Latitude tells how far north or south a place is located on the globe. Latitude is used along with longitude which tells how far east or west. A place is located in relation to an imaginary line that runs north and south. The prime meridian to map the exact location of any place on Earth. Because of Earth's round shape, the equator is the part of the world that is always closest to the Sun. Receiving its rays most directly. In other regions, sunlight hits Earth at an angle. And the additional amount of atmosphere through which it travels absorbs more heat leading to milder climates. The weather is usually very warm around the equator, regions collectively known as the tropics. Why does it rain? When the water droplets or ice crystals that make up clouds become too large to remain suspended in the air, they fall. Water in any form that falls from cloud snow, rain, hail is called precipitation. Many different conditions cause precipitation. In tropical regions of the world, Air currents cause the water droplets in a cloud to bump into one another. This bumping forces them together into larger droplets and they fall as rain. If the cloud is high in the sky, and the air the rain passes through is warm and dry. The rain may evaporate before it ever reaches Earth. In colder climates, most rain starts out as snowflakes or ice crystals. Depending on how high the cloud and how warm the air, these crystals will fall to earth either as rain or as snow, or perhaps as sleet or hail. Why does a compass needle always point north? A magnet made of iron or other special metals that are electrically charged has two poles. 
or ends, where its magnetic strength is greatest. Each end has an opposite electrical charge. When two magnets are held near each other, the poles that have the same charges repel each other. While the ends with opposite charges attract. The needle of a compass is a magnet and, believe it or not, so is Earth. Earth's greatest magnetic strength is concentrated at the magnetic north and south poles. Which are different from the geographical north and south poles. So a compass needle is attracted to the opposite electrical charges of Earth's poles. With the tip of its needle always pointing north and the bottom of its needle always pointing south. What is gravity? Gravity, or gravitation, is the force of attraction that exists. Between any two particles of matter, or any two objects. It is the force that holds planets in their orbits around the sun, or the moon in its orbit around earth. As the distance between two objects increases, their gravitational attraction decreases. Gravity is also the force that holds any object to earth or to any other heavenly body instead of allowing it to fly into space. The larger an object, the greater its gravitational pull. That explains with American astronauts that landed on the moon could leap about with little effort. With the moon much smaller than earth, its gravitational pull is one-sixth as strong as that of our planet. Gravity also explains why Earth and other planets and heavenly bodies are fairly round in shape. When our solar system was formed, gravity drew the dust and gases hurtling through space into lumps. When a great amount of matter is pulled together at one time. It crowds together into the shape of a ball because gravity pulls everything toward a center point. Still, Earth is not perfectly round. As it rotates on its axis, the spinning causes an additional force to pull against gravity. Making Earth bulge out a little around its middle. What are the cloudy streaks that airplanes sometimes make in the sky? When an aircraft flies very high in the sky where the air is cold the water vapor from the hot exhaust of its engines condenses, leaving a trail of clouds behind, called contrails. These streaks are not the same as skywriting, when pilots use airplanes to write messages in the air. For skywriting, a special machine on a plane creates and blows out white smoke to form letters. A pilot can only skywrite on clear, non-windy days. How do scientists measure the strength of an earthquake? A few different scales measure how strong an earthquake is. The best known is the Richter scale, created in 1935. Which uses an instrument called a seismograph to measure the size of the ground waves created by an earthquake. An earthquake's size, or magnitude, 
generally ranges from 1 to 8 on the Richter scale. Though the waves of some giant quakes have registered well beyond the top of the scale. The shock waves of an earthquake that registers a magnitude of 1 can only be detected with special instruments. While those with a magnitude of 8 cause massive damage. Every increase of one number means a tenfold increase in the strength of an earthquake, for example. A quake that measures 5 on the scale is 10 times stronger than one that measures 4. Some new methods have been devised to measure earthquakes, including one that measures what is called moment magnitude. This scale examines the size of the fault where the earthquake took place and measures how much Earth's crust has slipped. The Mercalli scale is also used to measure the strength of an earthquake. This scale works by describing the effect an earthquake has on people and structures. It lists 12 levels of intensity an earthquake can reach. At level 1, for example, only a few people may feel a quake. But at level 6, it is felt by all and damage starts to occur to buildings. A level 12 earthquake would bring about large-scale destruction. What is air? Air is a mixture of gases that circle Earth, kept in place by gravity. Air makes up Earth's atmosphere. The air we breathe is 78% nitrogen gas, 21% oxygen. 0.9% argon, and 0.03% carbon dioxide, along with water vapor floating molecules of water. Also present are traces of other gases and tiny bits of dust. Pollen grains from plants, and other solid particles. As our atmosphere extends higher and higher above Earth, toward outer space. Air becomes thinner and the combination of gases in the air changes. How did the planets get their names? All the planets in our solar system, with the exception of Earth, are named after ancient Greek or Roman gods and goddesses. Gigantic Jupiter, for instance, is named fittingly after the Roman king of the gods. The ancient Greeks and Romans believed that their gods and goddesses lived in the heavens. Astronomers of long ago who thought that Earth was the center of the universe and that the planets and sun orbited around it decided to use the names of these mythical heavenly dwellers when they labeled new planets. Because our planet was not considered a part of the heavens it was called Earth. Which means of the ground. Is it possible to dig deep enough into Earth's surface to come out on the other side? It's a journey that only a superhero could make. Earth is made up of different layers of rock. The outer layer, or crust, is solid layered rock that is about 20 to 30 miles, 32 to 48 kilometers. 
thick under the continents and about 3.5 to 5 miles, 5.6 to 8 kilometers, thick beneath the oceans. Earth's mantle, which is made up of a different kind of layered rock, extends for another 1,800 miles, 2,880 kilometers, below that. Although scientists cannot penetrate this deep into the planet, they know that the mantle's composition is different from the crust because shockwaves from earthquakes travel very differently through it. At the center of Earth is its core, which is more than 2,000 miles, 3,200 kilometers, deep. The core consists mostly of melted iron and nickel, with a solid metal center. Rock melts near the center of Earth because the great pressure of so much weight above raises temperatures there to between 5,000 and 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,760 to 3,871 degrees Celsius. The very center of Earth may reach temperatures as high as 13,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 7,000 degrees Celsius. Scientists believe that eruptions of volcanoes, with their hot gases and lava, or melted rock, relieve pressure from Earth's interior. That pressure escapes through the shifting plates of rock that make up Earth's crust. What is a rainforest? Rainforests are thick forests of trees and other plants. Found in the lowland areas of the tropics around the world. Rainforests exist in parts of Australia, Indochina, India, the Malay Peninsula, the East Indies, in Central and West Africa, and in Central and South America. Unlike forests in many other parts of the world, which have been affected by global climate changes like the Ice Age. Tropical rainforests have been growing uninterrupted in some places for millions of years. During that time an unimaginable number of different types of plants and animals have evolved to use every food source and live in every spot there. Tropical rainforests have more plant and animal species than the rest of the world combined. And scientists continue to discover new species. Because tropical rainforests are located near the equator, their climate is warm. The name rainforest comes from the fact that they receive a lot of rain between 160 and 400 inches throughout the year. Plants grow very quickly under such ideal conditions. In order to get the sunlight that they need for photosynthesis, the process by which they and other green plants make their own food. Rainforest trees grow very tall, up to 130 feet, 40 meters, high. Their tops form a huge canopy that shades most of the ground. Protecting plants on the ground from excessive sunshine as well as wind. Rainforest trees have very shallow roots, for the soil in which they grow is poor. Having long been depleted of nutrients by the needs of thick plant life over millions of years. But the abundant life all around contributes organic matter, the decomposed remains of plants and animals. To the surface of the soil, which is enough to nourish these grand, ancient forests.
What is lightning? In a large rain cloud, as water droplets bump into each other and increase in size. They become electrically charged. This activity causes electric charges on the ground, too. Sometimes the charges increase until they become so strong, up to 200 million volts. That electricity runs through the air between the cloud and the ground in the form of a giant spark or lightning bolt. Sometimes, instead of reaching from clouds to the ground, lightning strikes between two electrically charged clouds, or within a single cloud. This lightning looks like a sudden glow of light in the sky. Quite different from the jagged streak of light we think of as forked, or bolt, lightning. Why do helium-filled balloons float up in the air? While it may seem strange, the gases that make up air have weight. A cubic yard of air at sea level, which serves as the starting point from which all measurements of elevation, ocean depth, and atmosphere begin, weighs more than two pounds. When a balloon is filled with a gas like helium, which weighs less than air, it floats. What is Indian summer? In the United States, the term Indian summer refers to a period of warm, dry weather that sometimes occurs during autumn. Some people say a true Indian summer can only happen if this period of warm, Weather comes after the first frost, which is when temperatures are cold. Enough at night for water droplets on grass or car windshields to freeze. Indian summer is so named because it is believed that in past centuries, when such days of unexpected good weather came, Native American Indians would use that time to gather more food for winter storage. What is the highest place on Earth? The highest place on the surface of Earth is the top of MT. Everest, in the central Himalayas. A mountain system located on the border between Nepal and Tibet in southern Asia. Everest rises to 29,028 feet, 8,848 meters, above sea level. On May 28, 1953, New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary and Nepal native Tenzing Norgay were the first people to successfully make the trip to the top of Everest. Since then many mountain climbers have tried to reach the peak, few have succeeded. What is the highest place on Earth? The highest place on the surface of Earth is the top of MT. Everest, in the central Himalayas.
a mountain system located on the border between Nepal and Tibet in southern Asia. Everest rises to 29,028 feet, 8,848 meters, above sea level. On May 28, 1953, New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary and Nepal native Tenzing Norgay were the first people to successfully make the trip to the top of Everest. Since then many mountain climbers have tried to reach the peak, few have succeeded. What is the lowest place on Earth? The lowest place on the surface of Earth is believed to be in the Mariana Trench. Located deep in the western Pacific Ocean, extending southeast of the island of Guam to northwest of the Mariana Islands. It reaches down 36,198 feet, 11,034 meters, below sea level. What is the lowest place on Earth? The lowest place on the surface of Earth is believed to be in the Mariana Trench. Located deep in the western Pacific Ocean, extending southeast of the island of Guam to northwest of the Mariana Islands. It reaches down 36,198 feet, 11,034 meters, below sea level. How are caves formed? Caves are hollows in rock, either above or below ground. They are almost always formed when water wears away or dissolves rock. Although disturbances in Earth's crust like earthquakes and volcanoes can also create caves. When ocean waves crash against rocky cliffs, they carve out caves there over time. When an underground stream or rainwater repeatedly flows across the cracks of soft rock, like limestone or seeps through it the rock slowly dissolves, and a cave is formed. The world's deepest cave is at Rousseau Jean Bernard, located in France. It is 5,036 feet, 1,535 meters, deep. In Kentucky, at Mammoth Cave National Park, visitors can see the longest cave system. A series of connected caves, in the world. It extends more than 330 miles, 530 kilometers. It would seem that nothing could live or grow in deep caves or long cave systems. So far away from sunlight. But cave explorers have found that this is not true. Caves are home to some strange plants and animals that have adapted to their sunless surroundings. Many have no color or pigment, neither of which would serve a purpose in their pitch black world. Some animals are sightless for the same reason. Caves are fascinating places because they were the first homes of prehistoric men and women. Before they learned to build shelters. Caves often hold clues to what life was like when people were in their earliest stages of development. Fossil remains, ancient tools. 
and even primitive paintings made by cave dwellers can be found in some caves. How are caves formed? Caves are hollows in rock, either above or below ground. They are almost always formed when water wears away or dissolves rock. Although disturbances in Earth's crust like earthquakes and volcanoes can also create caves. When ocean waves crash against rocky cliffs, they carve out caves there over time. When an underground stream or rainwater repeatedly flows across the cracks of soft rock. Like limestone or seeps through it the rock slowly dissolves, and a cave is formed. The world's deepest cave is at Rousseau Jean Bernard, located in France. It is 5,036 feet, 1,535 meters, deep. In Kentucky, at Mammoth Cave National Park, visitors can see the longest cave system. A series of connected caves, in the world. It extends more than 330 miles, 530 kilometers. It would seem that nothing could live or grow in deep caves or long cave systems. So far away from sunlight. But cave explorers have found that this is not true. Caves are home to some strange plants and animals that have adapted to their sunless surroundings. Many have no color or pigment neither of which would serve a purpose in their pitch black world. Some animals are sightless for the same reason. Caves are fascinating places because they were the first homes of prehistoric men and women. Before they learned to build shelters. Caves often hold clues to what life was like when people were in their earliest stages of development. Fossil remains, ancient tools, and even primitive paintings made by cave dwellers can be found in some caves. What are stalactites and stalagmites? Caves form in huge, thick deposits of rocks like limestone, which dissolves over time when rainwater passes over or seeps through it. As water drips through the roof of a limestone cave, the drips leave bits of mineral behind, causing a stone column called a stalactite to form, which grows down in a cone shape like an icicle. Where the drips hit the cave floor, leaving behind more minerals. A stone column called a stalagmite forms, growing up. One way to remember which word describes which kind of growth is to think of STA lactites as holding tight to the ceiling. The G in stalagmites can stand for the word ground. Stalactites and stalagmites can become very large. And sometimes they meet in the middle, forming a single column or pillar of stone. The largest stalactite in the world is located in a cavern in County Clare, Ireland. It measures more than 23 feet, 7 meters, long. The largest stalagmite known to exist is located near Lazare in southern France. It measures more than 95 feet, 29 meters, in length and is still growing.
What are stalactites and stalagmites? Caves form in huge, thick deposits of rocks like limestone, which dissolves over time when rainwater passes over or seeps through it. As water drips through the roof of a limestone cave, the drips leave bits of mineral behind, causing a stone column called a stalactite to form, which grows down in a cone shape like an icicle. Where the drips hit the cave floor, leaving behind more minerals. A stone column called a stalagmite forms, growing up. One way to remember which word describes which kind of growth is to think of STA lactites as holding tight to the ceiling. The G in stalagmites can stand for the word ground. Stalactites and stalagmites can become very large. And sometimes they meet in the middle, forming a single column or pillar of stone. The largest stalactite in the world is located in a cavern in County Clare, Ireland. It measures more than 23 feet, 7 meters, long. The largest stalagmite known to exist is located near Lazare in southern France. It measures more than 95 feet, 29 meters, in length and is still growing. What is an island? An island is a body of land surrounded by water. While continents are also bodies of land surrounded by water, they are much larger in size. The smallest continent of the world is Australia. It has almost 3 million square miles, close to 8 million square kilometers, of area. That makes it almost four times the size of the world's biggest island Greenland which has an area of around 840,000 square miles, 2,175,000 square kilometers. What is an island? An island is a body of land surrounded by water. While continents are also bodies of land surrounded by water, they are much larger in size. The smallest continent of the world is Australia. It has almost 3 million square miles, close to 8 million square kilometers, of area. That makes it almost four times the size of the world's biggest island Greenland which has an area of around 840,000 square miles, 2,175,000 square kilometers. How are islands made? Islands can be created in a couple of ways. Either they are connected, or were once connected, to the continent that they are located near. Or they arise through the ocean floor during volcanic activity or other disturbances in Earth's crust. A continental island as the first kind is called may be a high part of the Continental margin or extension of land that is usually present underwater along a coastline. 
or may have been separated from its parent continent by a watery passageway carved out by the sea. Great Britain and Japan are examples of continental islands. The islands of Hawaii, on the other hand, are examples of oceanic islands. Because they were formed by volcanic activity on the floor of the Pacific Ocean some 40 million years ago. How are islands made? Islands can be created in a couple of ways. Either they are connected, or were once connected, to the continent that they are located near. Or they arise through the ocean floor during volcanic activity or other disturbances in Earth's crust. A continental island as the first kind is called maybe a high part of the continental margin or extension of land that is usually present underwater along a coastline. Or may have been separated from its parent continent by a watery passageway carved out by the sea. Great Britain and Japan are examples of continental islands. The islands of Hawaii, on the other hand, are examples of oceanic islands. Because they were formed by volcanic activity on the floor of the Pacific Ocean some 40 million years ago. Where does dirt come from? Dirt, or more accurately, soil, is the surface layer of earth in which plants can grow. It can be a few inches deep or extend down for several feet. It is made up of tiny pieces of rock of various sizes and shapes. Along with air, water, and humus, which is the decomposed remains of plants. The more humus soil contains, the better it can hold the nutrients and water that plants need to grow. The different types of rocks that make up soil are usually fine particles of parent rocks. That lie farther below Earth's surface, these have been made fine by erosion worn by wind. And water or by geological occurrences like volcanic eruptions and the movement of glaciers. There are many kinds of rocks composed of different minerals. And formed in different ways that make up Earth's crust. Where does dirt come from? Dirt, or more accurately, soil, is the surface layer of earth in which plants can grow. It can be a few inches deep or extend down for several feet. It is made up of tiny pieces of rock of various sizes and shapes. Along with air, water, and humus, which is the decomposed remains of plants. The more humus soil contains, the better it can hold the nutrients and water that plants need to grow. The different types of rocks that make up soil are usually fine particles of parent rocks. That lie farther below Earth's surface, these have been made fine by erosion worn by wind. And water or by geological occurrences like volcanic eruptions and the movement of glaciers. There are many kinds of rocks composed of different minerals. And formed in different ways that make up Earth's crust.
Where does sand come from? The rock particles that make up soil come in different sizes and are given different names to show this. Sand, often called a grain, is a piece of rock that measures from 0.0024 to 0.08 inches. 0.06 to 2 millimeters, across. Sand results when larger rocks disintegrate, eroded by water, weather, and glaciers. The two greatest deposits of sand on Earth's surface can be found in deserts and on beaches. When soil consists mostly of sand, its large grains cannot hold the water or nutrients needed. For healthy plant growth one reason you don't see many plants in the desert or on the beach. When you look closely at a handful of sand, you may find that the grains are really many different colors. This is because sand comes from several different kinds of rocks. Sand may appear brown, yellow, white, or even black, when it comes from certain volcanic rock. The sand of some beaches may also have grains made of organic material the remains of living creatures. Like shells and coral instead of rock. Where does sand come from? The rock particles that make up soil come in different sizes and are given different names to show this. Sand, often called a grain, is a piece of rock that measures from 0.0024 to 0.08 inches. 0.06 to 2 millimeters, across. Sand results when larger rocks disintegrate, eroded by water, weather, and glaciers. The two greatest deposits of sand on Earth's surface can be found in deserts and on beaches. When soil consists mostly of sand, its large grains cannot hold the water or nutrients needed. For healthy plant growth one reason you don't see many plants in the desert or on the beach. When you look closely at a handful of sand, you may find that the grains are really many different colors. This is because sand comes from several different kinds of rocks. Sand may appear brown, yellow, white, or even black, when it comes from certain volcanic rock. The sand of some beaches may also have grains made of organic material the remains of living creatures. Like shells and coral instead of rock. <laughs>